Um, I, want to I want to join the other speakers to uh, start the talk by thanking the organizer for, invi uh, for inviting me and also um, putting together such a wonderful program. I really enjoy learning new insights from all the talks from yesterday and also the posters. I appreciate the different approaches and systems that has been uh, devoted to this session to uh, allow us to understand the nervous system function from diverse approaches. So I hope uh, what I'm going to talk about today is still going to give you a, from a different angle. Uh, using C. elegans as a genetic model, I hope that we can start to gain some molecular and cellular insights on how motor circuit is precisely orchestrated to control locomotion. So all animals generate rhythmic motor outputs. Some are essential for viabilities, such as breathing. Um, sorry, is that a laser? Yes. Um, others actually just allows us to explore the environment, whether it's in the form of walking, hopping, swimming, or um, crawling, or flying. And although each motor circuit is specifically designed to allow an animal to generate very specific motor output, um, specific for this animal, I would like to come back to the end of the talk and hope I can convince you that there are some fundamental designs of the motor circuit that are shared by all this, um, allow the animal to generate the motor behavior. So one such common property that I would like to emphasize is the ability for motor circuit to generate this uh, motor antagonism. For example, for you to take a single step forward, you need to generate an far alternate firing pattern of the left and right um, um, uh, left and right alternate firing, and also in the leg, you need to generate this extensor and flexor alternate firing pattern. And the same thing for the fish, for it to swim, you do need to have a, co a coordinated relaxation and then um, contraction of the left, of the dorsal and ventral or the anterior posterior muscles. So, um, Dr. Greiner is actually one of the major contractions for me to come to this meeting, has given a very wonderful introduction about the basic understanding of how motor circuit generates rhythmic motor outputs. So, elegant work, uh, so far all our knowledge was pretty much coming from the electrophysiology studies of the large invertebrates and also the pioneering work of the vertebrate studies in, in the lampreys. So basically, this is a pretty, I don't want to repeat this, that, but basically decision making and the rhythm generation seems to arise from higher order neural networks in the foray brain and the brain stem. Those signals was being transduced to the central spinal work network where they generate various motors of central pattern generators that deride the um, orchestrated muscle contractions to generate a motor network that derived the motor locomotion. And all those different levels of the central pattern generator can be entrained and modified by the sensory inputs from internal and external environment, as well as the sensory uh, inputs from the movement themselves. So is it possible to generate a little bit more precise mechanism to cellular uh, understanding of how this communication between different layers of the network or within the network that's happening to allow the nervous system to generate a coordinated locomotion? This is, so in recent years, there's a drive to really try to understand the circuit in a more detailed cellular level, or even the connecton level. The idea is just exactly like the question that's been raised up in the previous talk. What we're trying to understand is really in the circuit, what are all the components and individual neurons, and how those neurons connect to each other, and how those individual neurons and all the synaptic connections con contribute to specific behaviors. As you can imagine, this is a pretty difficult task, at least for now, technically very challenging in a very large circuit. But this is where I hope that through the genetic studies in C. elegans, the behavior genetics, in a very simple uh, circuit with 302 neurons in total and less than a third contributing to local direct control of the locomotive control, that will allow us to gain more cellular and molecular insights. Okay, so. In the laboratory conditions, as you've seen in the previous talk, C. elegans um, generally predominantly generate a forward locomotion that's been uh, characterized by the, uh, from anterior posterior po uh, propagation of the body bends. These animals will occasionally activate the spontaneous backing, as you can see here. And this is usually a very short backing, and that's usually immediately followed either by resuming the forward foraging behavior or activating a big turn called the omega turn. So to understand how the C. motor circuit can really orchestrate all this behavior, all this locomotory output, 
I'd like to take this question a little bit even simpler than that. I want to dissect the locomotive behavior into three different steps. First question, for, for them to generate this kind of behavior, the CLX motor circuit has to initiate and propagate the body bends that either propagates from anterior to posterior direction that allows the animal to go forward or from a, a post, anterior to posterior direction to allow the animal to go backwards. So once the motor circuit initiate, generate its body bends, how does the elegance motor circuit can select and change the directionality of this uh, propagation direction that simplifies its movement? And lastly, we all know that like all the other animals, sea elegans like to forage as well. So what is the motor circuit basis that establishes this bias for the animal to usually prefer to go forward? So in today's talk, I will give you mostly of the, some of the published and unpublished data that we have to have some circuit basis to answer the second and the third questions. And then at the end of the talk, I'll talk about maybe the time you'll run out to give you some insights about how the first part is organized. So 20 years ago, John White and his colleague performed the EM analysis and reconstructed the entire wiring diagram of C. elegans. Coupled with the electrophysiology studies with a much larger nematode, Ascaris, where the electrophysiology analysis is feasible because of the large size that, uh, performed by Davis and Stratton, we can get a pretty good anatomical outframe of how C. elegans motor circuit might be organized at an anatomical level. So the sequential activation of the muscle contraction is mainly receiving inputs from two classes of cholinergic motor neurons, the A, the A and B motor neurons. These motor neurons are further divided into dorsal and ventral subgroup, depending on where the axon's output is, is the ventral muscle or dorsal muscle. These two neurons are pretty much identical in their morphology with the exception that the axons project into opposite direction. So the D motor neurons projected from anterior to posterior direction and A object oppositely. Based on this, it's been proposed by uh, John White and his colleagues that probably the B motor neuron is primarily the motor neuron driving forward movement because it can allow the propagation of the muscle contraction to the posterior direction and vice versa, the A neuron may be the predominant motor neuron driving forward movement. A third class of motor neurons, called the D-class motor neuron, further dividing the V and D-class again is GABAergic. These neurons receive inputs from the B or A, and then it's been proposed that because they're GABAergic, therefore inhibiting muscle contraction, might be the subunit, might be the component that generated body bending. And it's been proposed that the D and V, or D and A, form the microcircuit that allowed the muscle, among the C. elegans generating local bending where one side of the muscle contract and the other side relax. And all those mini nickel circuit uh, form this uh, repeated modules localized along the, ventral dors along the ventral side of the animal from anterior to posterior region. And then each one has a synaptic output that's not overlapping. So it's been proposed that those little micro circuit receive inputs from five classes of motor neurons, pre-motor interneurons, classically called the command interneurons. It's been proposed that all these neurons are probably pro providing a role to innervate all those little microcircuits of, of the motor neurons to organize body bending. And because of the number of the uh, pre-motor interneurons is so small, it allows um, Marty Chalfi and his colleagues, as well as Stephen Wicks, a graduate student in Caffey's lab, many years ago performed laser ablation experiment to identify the key premotor interneurons driving locomotion. So to take a long story short, what they found is laser ablation of those two classes of premotor interneurons that label in red, when you, ablate, when you ablate both of them, you can predominantly uh, make the animal unable to go forward while the animal is still capable of generating backward movement. Coincidentally, these are the premotor interneurons generate a primary gap junctional input or chemical input to the B-class motor neuron where have the axons projecting backwards. So this has been uh, proposed to be the forward driving motor circuit. And ablation of combinations of the AVA, AVD, AVD, uh, blue premotor interneurons makes the animal unable to generate backward movement while the forward locomotion is still relatively intact. 
And coincidentally, all these are the premotor interneurons that generate chemical synaptic input as well as gap junction coupling to the A class motor neurons. So, the predominant hypothesis in our field is really there are two separate motor circuits driving forward and backward locomotion. And I want to draw attention to uh, this specific interneuron, AVA, has mixed chemical and the gap junction inputs to the A class motor neurons. So although it's been proposed to have two dedicated motor circuits for two directional movement, it has always been noted that inter and intracellular, um, inter-circuit synaptic communication is quite abundant between all those neurons. And there are chemical synapses and gap, uh, gap junctions. So what are the potential roles of the synapses? Quite a few labs have, uh, began to, has begun to address those roles. And then the work, um, from quite a few groups, I'll just highlight one here, from actually VLUS group, many years ago, they actually found that, suggest that this inter-circuit communication may affect the propensity for directional movement. So VLUS group pioneered uh, the molecular studies of those interneurons, and what he found is actually all those neurons express uh, different combinations of the glutamate receptors. And when they expressed a specific um, leaky glutamate receptor artificially modulate the activity or excitability, uh, activity of those interneurons by overexpressing a mammalian form specific leaky glutamate receptor in either all of those premotor interneurons or subset of premotor interneurons, they find those animals changing the propensity, increasing the backward movement at the expense of the forward locomotion. Another key study that uh, suggests that the inter-circuit communication affects the selection of the uh, locomotion comes from uh, Mark Alkima's work when he was a postdoc in Horvitz group as well as in his own group, where he found this, this specific neuron called RAM forms a gap junction with AVA and a chemical synaptic into to ABB. And this neuron is the only C. elegans neuron expressed tyramine uh, neurotransmitter and the only neuronal uh, component that, that expresses the receptor for this tyramine, which is a tyramine uh, activated chloride channel, is expressing AVB. Because the chloride channel is proposed to hyperpolarize in the neuron, the idea is this RAM's chemical synaptic input to AVB might be actually inhibitory. And when he actually genetically ablate this synaptic communication using the enzyme, using the mutant that failed to generate tyramine, or the mutation that failed to express the receptor, these animals further reduce their ability to generate, uh, propensity to generate backward movement. So where all those studies suggest there's a lot of intercircular communications, um, likely through directly the chemical synaptic or gap junction communications, to really gain an understanding how those motor circuit really generate behavior, what we really need is to develop a system that allows us to visualize the dynamics of the motor circuit in the live animal and coordinate the motor circuit dynamics with specific motor output. And to address this question, uh, this becomes possible only in the recent years with the advent of uh, a whole bunch of optogenetic tools. And this is the uh, genetic calcium sensors that's been developed by two really talented groups, Raja Shen and Lauren Luger at the Chilean farm. Basically, this takes advantage of the fact that we know for a long time that neuron activity correlates to calcium dynamics. Higher calcium usually correlates with higher neuronal firing and neuronal activity. And these are the proteins, genetic calcium sensors, that will change its fluorescent property in response to the concentration change, uh, change in the concentration of the intracellular calcium. So for example, chameleon is one form of this uh, genetic calcium sensor. Well, it, uh, YFP and CFP are bound by the calcium binding module of the commodulin uh, binding calcium domain. And in the presence of how calcium, uh, these two proteins are brought closer together that generate a threat response. So y increased YFP, CFP can be used as indirect measure of the neuronal firing. And the same idea of the GFP can be reconstituted in the presence of how calcium. So therefore, the increase of the GFP fluorescence can be used as an indicator of a neuronal firing. Sorry. So a postdoc, a postdoc fellow in my lab, uh, Kao, uh, Taizo Kawano, developed a very uh, effective system where it allows him to, ex using transgenic animals that express those genetic calcium sensors in specific neurons of interest, and then simultaneously monitor the fluorescent intensity change in those neurons as well as the positional change of those neurons in real time. 
And this is a fully automated system so that he can, visual, he can coordinate activity change of the neurons as well as the behavior changes, especially in the locomotion. So the movie doesn't really show up um, as well, but basically what you can see, the warmer color tends the higher activity of the neuron is. And we further expanded the study now that this is, uh, we're examining all the motor circuit neurons, uh, proposed motor circuit neuron activity. Not only we can visualize the calcium change in the soma, now we can also observe the calcium change in the dendrites and axons in real motion. So for example, this is the GABAergic neurons being proposed to be coordinating with the muscle, generating muscle bending, uh, relaxation. And as you can see, this axon of this neuron generates a pretty high uh, calcium and activity when the animal is uh, relaxing the other side. And this is another neuron that we can do simultaneous imaging of the soma as well as the axon. And just if you wait for two seconds, you can see actually a big calcium influx in the axon while the animal is going back in. And this change is actually tenfold higher than what you can observe in the soma. So what do we find? When we combine or compare the calcium profiles of individual neurons with the emotion profile, so this is exactly the same fluorescent objects um, of the calcium level, uh, relative calcium level, as well the position of the fluorescent objects. And each dot corresponds to the reading of the frame of this animal compared to the previous frame. If this animal is generating a forward locomotion, it's above the zero. If it's generating a backward locomotion, it's uh, in the, in, in, about, uh, lower than zero. And the y-axis indicates how much it's moved, therefore can be used as an index for the speed. So this is an observation made by when we correspond with the AVA, this blue pre-command interneurons. You can see the rising of the increase of the neuron activity correlates really nicely with the initiation of the animal from forward to backward movement. The same observation actually has been made in previous years by uh, Chris Cronin in Corey's group as well as other groups and also Sean Lockery's group. But when we actually, the, thing, the new stuff we identified is when you actually correspond the activity of the red command interneurons or premotor interneurons, you see the opposite trend. You see a rising of the activity corresponds to the animal changing directions from backward locomotion to forward locomotion. And the temporal correlation of the, te uh, the switch was, was very precise, especially for the AVA and the AVE. So this suggests that we actually has, um, this is the, the third one. <laughs> so this suggests that we can, after we survey all the premotor interneurons, we basically have two classes. One class of premotor interneurons activity change increase corresponds with initiation of the backing, and the other one corresponds with initiation of the forward. So that suggests that these two premotor interneurons have anti-correlated activity. Can we observe that in vivo? And then we can. So we see we did uh, uh, simultaneously uh, premotor neuron imaging of three or four different classes together. Uh, as you can see, these are the red, these are the blue uh, neurons. Uh, were actually so showing a pretty high activity, uh, highly synchronized activity in these cases, with the exception of this one AVD. So even though this one has the same synaptic output as all the other two neurons, these neurons do not actually contribute any activity during spontaneous movement, where recent show that this neuron only contributes become active when you stimulate the animals. And then when you do the uh, opposite classes, you can see that the blue and red actually have anti-correlated activity pattern, suggesting that these two classes of premotor interneurons have this anti-correlation uh, and also un cross inhibition. And that's what we've been showing over here. So how does this anti-correlation translate into the motor neuron level? This is when we get a little bit of a surprise. The predominant model is really these premotor interneurons activate this and these activates over that. So we expect that to see an activation pattern of the motor neurons corresponds with forward and backward. The specific class corresponds to forward and backward. But that's really not the case. So as you can see, this animal is continuously generating a forward movement with quite a constant speed. And you see this f all four classes of motor neurons in, including the ventral and dorsal driving B class motor neurons and ventral and dorsal driving A class motor neurons, showing quite organized activity pattern, but the bottom arm is all four neurons are active. 
And we see the uh, expected anti-correlation eventual on dorsal driving neurons, but we're seeing both B and I being active. But the difference is we always see that this, B neuro, this animal is going forward, and we always see B activity is higher than A. And this pattern is more obvious when you allow the animal to change direction spontaneously. In this 10 minutes, uh, 5 minutes recording, you can see this animal constantly switching directions. And while both A and B motor neurons are activated during either directions, the animal always able to separate activity level between the B and A's. And more interestingly, when you actually see this transition of these local motions, you see a simultaneous drop of one motor neuron and the increase of the other. And that can be shown quite nicely with this correlation uh, profile over there. So these activity profiles suggest to us that all those motor neurons actually maintain the basal level of activity during locomotion regardless of the direction. But the motor circuit is able to generate a separation or imbalance of activity. When the B is higher than A, the animal generates forward locomotion. When A is higher than B, the animal generates locomotion. And then actively switch simultaneously this correspond, uh, co coordination to generate a switch of the directionality. So that's been illustrated over here. And so far, we only observed this as a phenomenon. So this could be whether this is actually just a consequence of the animal switching directions, or this is actually a causative, the actual driving force for animal to choose and switch directions. And if this is really the driving cause for directional movement, can we get to the molecular and cellular insights, understanding how those motor circuits using those existing synapses to generate this imbalanced motor neuron output? So this is when CL genetics, or in general, the behavior genetics can become really handy. I've told you before that wild-type animals prefer to go forward and quite uh, occasionally generate spontaneous backward movement, and the circuit does have actually this bias towards forward locomotion. But even in the, in the 70s, when Sidney Brenner first established the elegance as a genetic model to study development as well as behavior, he identified a large number of genetic mutants that shows very interesting behavior output. This is one specific mutant that he called as kinkers, and this is a very obvious description why he's calling, in, calling them kinkers, because these animals are kink instead of generating a very smooth sinusoidal wave. But one thing that we're a bit surprised when we look at a mutant, I was surprised why for 20 years people did not quite notice that. These animals are really have a complete switch bias for forward and backward locomotion. This is the head and that's the tail. If you use the curvature curve, we're plotting the curvature curve over time from head to tail. You can see this curvature back propagating curvature symbolize forward movement and occasion backward movement. These animals have two phases. This is the kinking phase. They're generating a very deep body bends, but they're not really going anywhere. Or the animal is generating generally a trend of backward movement. So automated locomotion analysis that we've done actually shows very, very clearly. And like wild type animals, 80% of the frames, the animals is in the forward mode you have this reduced to 20%. And if you look at the duration, how those specific frames are organized, the kinkers have a, those forward locomotion was actually scattered. They're not organized into long traveling. But if you look at the backing, these animals' traveling duration was much, much higher. And then co co um, correlated with actually higher incidence for animal going backwards. When we perform calcium imaging analysis of those mutants, these mutants show two types of striking uh, calcium imaging patterns. We've never seen that in wild type, but we'll see that 80% of the time in these animals, where the A and B motor neurons shows exactly superimposed calcium profiles. The other 20% cases, these animals generate a, a higher than B uh, trend. And those usually correlate with the animals going backwards. And this usually go correlates with the kink. So this suggests to us that wild type animals as intrinsic mechanism to make sure that A and B motor neurons outputs do not overlap. And kinkers fail in that mechanism so that the B equals A replaces the B higher than A uh, pattern, preventing that animals go forward, but backing seems to be still restored and actually this animal switched the preference to push to that state. And if this is really the driving force, we should be able to fix the kinker defects by artificially forcing the animal to regenerate the B higher than A pattern without the genetic rescue. 
So we can do that by optogenetic rescue because now we argue that we have reagents that we can silence the B motor neuron activity, transduce those transgene in the kink mutants, and see if the kink becomes a forward locomotion. And that's exactly what we saw. So using halorhodopsin expressing the A-class motor neurons, and what I will show you is the transgenic animal, these are all kink the same genetic background, the transgenic animals showing fluorescence express halorhodopsin in the A motor neurons, and this one doesn't. So you can see when you shine the light on, you activate a chloride channel activated by halorhodopsin. Now these animals turn into forward movement, and then the kinkers, non-transgenics, doesn't. We confirmed these results with endogenous silencer, uh, C. elegans-specific potassium channel that hyperpolarized the neurons. And in the kinker background, you see it's restoring a quite good, smooth sinusoidal movement. And we, indeed, in all those animals, we restored a B higher than A uh, calcium imaging pattern. So this experiment really proved to us that this uh, separation of the neuronal activity output is the driving force for selection of the directionality. And we also noticed that, uh, this is some of his unpublished work, that this disruption of this anterior posterior motor antagonism through the A and B neurons is specific for anterior posterior, but it's not disrupting with the ventral and dorsal aspect. And we do actually have a very interesting C. elegans mutant that disrupts with all this coordination. So all the A and B and the V class and D class are synchronously firing. And when that fires, what you see is an animal that's generating a shrinker phenotype. So what are the molecular mechanisms to set up this motor antagonism or separation of the A and B motor output? These two mutants, the kinker mutants identified in Cindy Brunner's screen, has been cloned many years ago. One of the kinkers is cloned by Todd Sturridge in, um, in University of Minnesota. It encodes ANC7, a C. elegans, an invertebrate version of the gap junction proteins in Nexon. And then the other kinker, ANC9, is cloned by Hikimi from uh, University of McGill. And this also includes another index and co 7 When you have double null mutants, this exhibit identical genetic phenotypes as either of the loss of function of ANC7 or ANC9, suggesting that these the two gap junction proteins function together, and loss of function of either one or both of them leads to this uh, inability for the motor circuit to separate BNA motor output. Both inexins are expressed quite broadly in the nervous system, and then genetic rescue experiment we have performed also show that they are only required in the nervous system to restore this locomotion. This is using an antibody generated by Todd Sturridge against ANC7. You can see the localization of this ANC7 in this um, presumed gap junctions between the motor neuron cell bodies and the premotor interneurons, but as well as numerous small punctate expression patterns along the axons of motor neurons, as well as the sensory neurons and also the premotor interneurons. Because the expression pattern of ANC7 and ANC9 are pretty broad, we try to narrow down exactly where those gap junction or gap junction proteins are functionally required, most critically required to restore this uh, locomotion. So we perform a very simple uh, cell type specific rescue experiment where we drive the expression of ANC7 or ANC9 in all those neurons uh, that has been shown to form gap junctions and then see which one can restore this animal to forward locomotion. Previously, Todd Sturridge group has found that this gap junction between ABB interneuron and the B motor neuron uh, requires the localization of ANC7 and ANC9, ANC7 here, ANC9 here. However, in the same paper, they also notice by restoring those proteins in this gap junction pair, doesn't really have any profound effect in rescuing the locomotion. So though these proteins are present, functional contribution is actually not very prominent. What they noticed, and also we reproduced, uh, we actually noticed at the same time, is the uh, ANC7 in Exxon is actually required only specifically in AVA premotor interneurons to almost fully rescue the kinker behavior defects in those in Exxon mutant. We further notice that if you express ANC9 in the A motor neurons, it rescues ANC9's kinker phenotype. And then in ANC7, ANC9 double loss of function mutant, you need to specifically restore AVA with ANC7 and the A with ANC9 to restore the, the kinker mutant into forward locomotion. So what that suggests is gap junction between AVA and A is the predominant functional causes the defect that causes the animal unable to separate A and B motor neuron activity difference.
and this just all the sounds. So this gives us a little bit of a puzzle. We oh, I actually found that about three years ago. If you remember the defect in this uh, king commuting is they bias the animal to go backwards. And what we see is the defect that leads to that is actually loss of gap junction between the backward circuit that's supposed to be driving backward locomotion. So this is a paradox. So why does losing this backward, supposedly backward driving circuit uncoupling actually leads to an increase of the bias for backing? And we figured out, uh, take a long time, is actually we found this gap junction is inhibitory. So we demonstrate this by multiple ways. When we um, do, we can perform calcium imaging analysis in this AVA uh, premotor interneurons. So what you can see this is the raw data of individual recordings. You're recording the calcium level uh, over time and then plot them, over, uh, plot them afterwards. So basically what you can see is the average calcium level in the AVA premotor neuron in the wild type and the king commutants is much higher in the, in the absence of those gap junction proteins. Consistent with our previous finding, this two-class premotor interneurons cross-inhibit. When we see a higher increase of the AVA activity, the cross-inhibit premotor interneuron AVB has a decreased activity. We can also observe this directly by interest, uh, intracellular recording, where uh, we patched uh, AVA neurons using, uh, inter, inter, in the dissected C. elegans probe. We find this uh, excitatory uh, EPSCs has an increased amplitude, although the frequency was not changed. And this phenotype is specific because we can restore this amplitude by restoring UNC7 specific in the AVA neuron. So why would uncoupling lead to an increased electric and also intracellular calcium level change indicating a higher activity of the neurons? We find this is primarily because this uncoupling leads to an increased input resistance of AVA. So when you inject the same amount of currents in wild type and on seven mutants, you can induce a much higher depolarization event because probably due to the uh, uncoupling of the membranes between AVAs and the A-motor neurons. So because I've, I mentioned it from the beginning, AVA is unique in the way that it's not just coupling to the A-neurons through cap junctions, it's also sending chemical synaptic output to the A-motor neurons. And then we know that AVA is through VLUS work, that AVA is glutamergic. So the chemical synaptic output is most likely to be excitatory. The reason that when you increase the excitability of the AVA neuron, that will lead to an increase of the chemical synaptic output, and that might be the cause of this animal initiating backward more frequently and then longer. And if that's the case, we should be able to block the kinker's increased propensity for backing by specifically blocking the chemical synaptic output of AVA. So we did that by two things. In the kinker, the same kinker mutant background, we can silence the AVA's electric activity using the potassium channel, TWIC18, and or we can use a toxin, express technotoxin specific in the AVA neurons so that you can prevent the formation of the SNEER complex, therefore release of the synaptic vesicles. And in both cases, I hope you can see that these animals are still kinking, but they can no longer go backwards, increase the backing like the kinker does. So from these studies, um, we can actually draw in. Through many years of work, we finally have some conclusions. It's a little bit surprising, but it took us a long time to get there. That the gap junction communication between AVA, command interneuron, premotor interneuron, and A is inhibitory, and in, it functions as a current shunt to self-maintain the backward circuit at the low state. And that's probably the circuit basis for the animals who normally prefer to go forward. So the second thing we realize is, um, I don't know if you paid attention to it, um, initially we assumed that when we silenced the AVA's act chemical synaptic activity in the kinker mutants, now in this case, AVA actually has absolutely no input into the A neurons anymore. We should assume this animal to go from kinker to forward movement. But as we've seen a complete block of backing, these animals cannot still go forward. What that suggests is in these animals, although it can no longer generate A higher than B output, it can still, it cannot generate B higher than A, it just push it back into B equals to A output. And this is really strange initially for us because these neurons are not supposed to have any electrical and chemical synaptic output. 
So we wonder, maybe this residual activity of the amotor neurons coming from the miswiring, because a lot of developmental studies has been suggesting that if you blocked the, early, the proper wiring in the early developmental stages, there will be compensatory mechanism coming up and the force other wiring, other wiring diagram. We wonder if that's maybe just a consequence because the gap junction was not present in the early stage. So to test that, if that's the case, we decided to silence all the premotor interneurons in the kinker mutants. In this case, we can actually kill, we're basically using the TUC18, the potassium channel, to basically block all 10 premotor interneurons so that those motor neurons are now hanging actually alone from the sensory inputs and all the high interneuron inputs. And in those cases, we still see a kinker animals that doesn't go forward or backward, but it's kind of residual sitting in the state. So what that suggests to us is those, pre -motor, those, interneur, those motor neurons are having spontaneous activities and in the absence of the premotor interneuron input, both A and B motor neurons exhibit the same level of uh, activity and, and basically generating an animal that's trying to activate forward and backward um, muscle bent propagation at the same intensity. So basically you have a tug of war of this animal trying to go to two directions at the same time end up not traveling anywhere. Okay, almost there. If that's the case, we should be able to mimic the kinker phenotype by generating a wild type animal that we can use in ablation to anatomically remove the connection or inputs from all the premotor interneurons. And this is what we saw. So we took a long time to do this experiment uh, with the help actually with a lot of colleagues in the C. elegans field. Oh, sorry, this is past. So um, we treat it in two different ways. So this is using anatomical uh, atoptosis plus a laser ablation using a reagent generously given it to us by Velus group. So we basically uh, killed all those neurons because they die. Uh, they uh, activate uh, apoptosis. And then this one we're using a more, um, a more recent reagent generated by Roger Shen's lab where they can use Minisoc can activate the cell death, uh, can activate the, um, the neuronal cell death upon the uh, uh, illumination. This actually have a stable transgene loss to quantify the behavior analysis. So in both cases, in a genetic wild type background, when you actually remove all the inputs from the premotor interneurons, you generate a kinker phenotype. So we do get some um, Logistics, I think, for CLNs locomotion, we believe that an imbalanced forward backward motor output states determined and the dictate a switch between directional movement. And premotor interest in interneuron is actually not essential for activation of the motor neurons. They potentiate, but the more key important role that we found is actually establish an anterior posterior motor antagonism. And we already observed a cross inhibition between the two classes of premotor interneurons. We believe this cross inhibition constitutes part of the mechanism to establish the imbalance. And we believe that they actually modify the endogenous motor neuron activity where both chemical and electrical synapses. And then in the absence of those gap junctions, you're going to get uh, uh, an equal state um, activity of the forward and backward activities uh, pattern. And then chemical synap remaining act uh, chemical synaptic input will increase the neuronal activity of AVA, drive the animals prefer to go activate backing instead of forwarding. And this would only work if the gap junction is directional because that predicts this gap junction is having an instructive role to instruct the, ha the activity state. And that's what we observed. Basically what we do is in wild type animals, we can silence the amotor neuron activity and do calcium imaging in the AVA neurons. And it doesn't matter how we silence the amotor neuron activity, it does not have a negative impact on AVA. So that suggests that especially in the case of a mixed chemical synaptic outputs in a neural circuit, those neurons can actually generate much more complex input-output functions. Instead of a simple uh, model of gap junctions to synchronize the activity or compartmentalize a, neur a neural circuit, actually this, this is my favorite review. Uh, a very talented invertebrate neurobiologist, Lorena Rila, has previously uh, shown us some really nice invertebrate studies that shows examples of this. Um, because of the time, I'll just go through this. In this case, uh, these two neurons are, are coupled by gap junctions, a chemical synapsis. Activation of one neuron will induce the activation of the other, and actually a very short pulse can generate a very long pulse depolarizing event because there's a positive feedback loop. And this is another uh, 
example that I don't have time, but basically in this case, we felt like we, we can show that the gap junctions basically downregulate the activity state of this uh, motor circuit, but meanwhile, the chemical synaptic input have a positive effect, and when this circuit become activated. So this is basically suggesting that motor antagonism is the similar underlying mechanism for both walking and then undulation. Previous work from Tom Jessel's group and, 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 and several other groups actually shown that premotor interneuron input in a mouse is required for generating this nice alternate firing pattern that drives the left and right limb muscle contraction, the hind limb of the mouse. And when you actually get rid of those premotor interneurons, you generate a synchronized activity, spontaneous activity of the motor neuron output that generates a hopping mice instead of a walking mice. And we think this is actually not so different from the case that we're seeing in the C. elegans. Instead of having undulation in one direction, we're having a kinker basically activating two directions at the same time. And the Drosophila, so you might be interested if this organization of the undulation is pretty much encoded in the motor neuron themselves, how would those undulations got initiated and propagated? Okay, I can just stop over there. <laughs> uh, it's coming up pretty soon, so uh, I can, we can maybe talk about it in discussion if you want to. Can I? Sorry. Do you want me to stop? I could. Okay, so this, is, this, this requires a basically establish, I'm sorry for this, it's, it's brighter here. Uh, basically what I'm trying to show is if you can see this kind of a light bulb string of the activation of the B-class motor neurons. Uh, that's have a high activity during locomotion and you can see this kind of a nice separation of the phase activation. So Taizo Kawano and Michelle Poe in my lab set up this system. And then um, Aravi Samuel and Tran Wan's group has been interested in this actually for many years. What they actually observed was actually the uh, um, anterior-posterior propagation of the muscle is actually seems to be um, adaptive to the environment. They can actually show that using this very clever micro, microfluid uh, device, when they induce body curvature in any part of the body, the posterior region of the body immediately follows the formed curvature and they can do that acute. So basically what that suggests to us is this uh, appropriate separate coupling of this um, along the body is, is probably the driving force for the animal to generate this propagation. So when we actually set up this motor neuron imaging uh, uh, device, so they, uh, we, we started collaborating because they're engineers and they're much better at <laughs> measuring forces and, and at doing imaging analysis. Basically, they adopt our system in the microfluid chips and then Chen Wan did an excellent job showing that the D class motor neuron ventral and dorsal bending, the activity of the neuron is completely proportional to the, uh, to the um, um, to the degree of the, the bending. And also did a nice uh, time uh, temporal expression studies and find that activation of the VB class is always a slightly ahead of the DB class. So with this and also other experiments that we basically got an idea that basically the B motor neurons themselves can organize a wave propagation from anterior posterior by acting as the mechanical sensor, immediately sensing the bending curvature of the body anterior to it and then activate those neurons and that basically drive this propagation. So can we get a molecular handle on this? I think we can. The reason we started collaboration is five years ago, Michelle Poole and then Barbara, another graduate student in my lab, identified C. elegans mutant that we suspected to be specifically defective in this process. This is a movie that's not running, but if you can see this movie, these animals basically started to drive in forward movement and then the propagation stops halfway and then the tail ends up dragging. We call it the dragger. If you look at the calcium imaging of the muscles, this propagation defect is fairly obvious. So you can generate a bending wave from the head and it stops over there. And then the, the entire posterior body cannot propagate this uh, activity. So we recently cloned these genes and we're collaborating. Uh, uh, we're working closely together with Ari's group to get to the mechanistic details on how, those, uh, how this protein actually generates, uh, activates this uh, propagation events. So as a closing mark, I would like to really uh, just end like this. I'm trained as a geneticist, and then uh, I do believe that using behavior genetics in a simple organism with a very well annotated um, wiring diagram of the nervous system may be able to give us a molecular and synaptic decoding insights on the motor behaviors.
And these are the people who's done the work. Taizo Kawano is a postdoc in lab, set up the imaging system. Michelle Po did the Kinker work. Sean Bangal is a talented electrophysiologist uh, that's done quite nice imaging work. And none of this work is uh, possible without the stimulating collaborations with our collaborators in the University of Toronto, Harvard, and uh, uh, all those places. And then we thank everybody for reagents. Uh, Corey gave us tetanotoxin. Andrew, uh, uh, Vilo gave us the uh, apoptotic uh, transgene to kill pre-motor pre interneurons. Jean and Roger gave us the uh, mini sock and Jasmine Shaw for ang 7 antibody. Bill Schaefer and Rick Skrur is really the pioneer of our field to start the calcium imaging analysis in C. elegans. I think uh, we should put them over there. And the fundings, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for the lecture. Uh, I just want to ask, like, uh, like, are the, like, have you studied any sensory neurons which are responsible for the forward and backward uh, like locomotion are they different in both the cases or are they the same sensory neurons and it is just the interneurons which are a bit different um, so these neurons are called the premotor interneurons because it's kind of a recent uh, name because they're they're a specific class that's supposed to be gating all the inputs from upper layer inputs into the motor neurons so different sensory inputs would go through maybe different layers of the first layer or second layer interneuron, but they all converge onto these five premotor interneurons. And among these five classes of premotor interneurons, AVA is the one that received most of the inputs uh, from other neurons as well from other neurons in the whole premotor neuron input, uh, the, the circuit. Just one more question, like yeah. uh, in the AVA neuron, like uh, is the AVA L and AVA R, do they behave exactly the oh. same or are they different a little bit? Or? Oh, very good question. So, so yeah, mm -hmm. obviously you understand the ceiling. We haven't done a lot of detailed studies on that. Um, a few recordings we've done, we haven't really seen much of a difference. So most of the data that I show is a port data of the two. Um, ablation of only one AVA or uh, left or right hasn't really, in our hands at least, hasn't really changed the behavior output that much. So that suggests this, this functional redundancy between the two, and or they can at least function to compensate for each other. But there could be some molecular subtlety difference that we haven't discovered. And that when the technique evolves, we can probably dissect that a little bit more. So, yeah. so <coughs> the Reciprocal activity between the dorsal and ventral motor neurons in each class. Yes. Is that occurring through direct interaction, inhibitory interaction between the motor neurons, or what is between the, the two? So uh, the mini circuit, I kind of overglossed that. So the uh, anatomical diagram basically says the Bs, um, both VB and DBs will have a dyadex input not just to the muscle, but to the corresponding D-class motor neurons, the GABAergic ones. And then the same D motor neurons will have a projection of the axon on the opposite side. So it's been, pr it's been proposed that this is the uh, lateral inhibition circuit, that when you activate that, the Ds, the VB, when VB activate ventral muscles, you co-activate the DD neurons, and the DD neurons inhibits the Ds. So, so this VB and D because uh, this pattern, Initially, just I think yeah, none of them has been published officially, but will be suggested it's not mutual, like a direct communication. Uh, but there's always this paradox in the field that when you have an unclonified mutant that cannot generate GABA, it's basically an enzyme, these animals can still generate pretty good sinusoidal wave, especially in the forward locomotion. There's a change. So there's something else that's driving this. Um, this, I didn't really talk about this because that's other people's work, the trans work. Looks like the activation of, there's a slight phase shift between the two, V and V class and then D class. And I'm starting to think that these two neurons are having some intrinsic differences in terms of the excitability or the uh, uh, synaptic output because the input from pre-motor interneuron into the Vs is actually outnumbered the ones into the Ds if you look at carefully of that. So maybe there's some communication between them too that's mediated uh, through, me <laughs> through mechanisms that uh, I don't know if I should discuss even more. It, it's not direct chemical synaptic output dependent but it could be neuronal communication dependent. So, so.
Thank you.